and welcome to Us in Blue TV studio. My name is Riina Nieminen and I will be hosting Fireside Chat today. Fireside Chat is a new program on Us in Blue TV this year and we are going to interview some of the seminar speakers, vloggers and streamers. Now here with me is Kadri Ugand as a guest. Welcome Kadri. Thank you so much. So Kadri, you are the co-founder of Game Founders, the global gaming startup accelerator. Uh, can you tell us about Game Founders? Yeah, sure. Um, so Game Founders is a games accelerator. I mean, uh, people probably know Startup Sauna in, in Finland. So mm -hmm. we more or less do what they do, but we do it in only in the game sector. So we look for teams all over the world. We select 10 at a time. They come to wherever our hub is and uh, we help them f during three months with different seminars and mentors and uh, intros and, and demo days and play test sessions and, and different kinds of formats. So our goal is to, uh, to help them build the business around their games and, uh, and for them to have successful studios at the end. We started in 2012 in Estonia and uh, we ran two years there. And now last year we expanded to Asia, so currently we're operating in Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur. Okay, so do you operate all over the world or do you have to be from Europe or Asian that they can apply for you? Uh, we, don't, we don't distinguish, so they can be from wherever and they can make whatever kinds of games. So we have both uh, mobile and PC, we have VR studios, so we have different studios uh, in our portfolio. And we just look at the team. We just look at if they have uh, a very good vision, if they have a good product, if they know where they want to go, and if they really want to make a business out of it and not just stay a sort of a lifestyle indie, which is okay to be, but in that case, you probably don't look for investors. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so how did you come up with the idea of Game Founders? Mm -hmm. So we established Game Founders in 2012. And that was the time where there were so many accelerators already, including Startup Sauna. And, uh, and then we, we thought we wanted to do something different within the accelerator model. So we decided to do a very strict vertical and uh, just concentrate on, on one thing. And, uh, and sort of, uh, we ended up with gaming because uh, my co-founder also has a, a gaming background. And uh, we see that uh, the game industry is really growing super fast. It's bigger than films for I don't know how many years already. And, uh, and also it's, uh, it's very huge in terms of uh, number of uh, investments and size of mergers and acquisitions. So it's also a very lucrative business. But, you know, of course, a lot of people know that. So it's very crowded mm -hmm. as well. That's true. And uh, did you also have a background on gaming? Me personally, no. So I've been working with uh, different uh, startups uh, from, uh, well, more or less all my career. But uh, they have since, uh, like, until Game Founders, they have been more tech startups. But I think a lot of the things that, you know, how you build a studio and how you build a team and how you strategize, it's still a lot the same if you're in gaming or not. But uh, now for the past four years, I've only been in gaming. Okay. And uh, when you started up uh, Game Founders, was there any difficulties in the start? Now you're doing great, but in the start, what was the difficulties? Actually, honestly, it was easier than I thought. Because okay. um, like the, the, sort of, like the reason why we did Game Founders was we were looking at game studios and they didn't go to tech accelerators. So because, you know, in tech accelerators you have 10 teams Maybe one is gaming and the rest is like logistics and tourism and something, something. And it's not like the content is not 100% relevant to them. And also for the mentors, like they don't really want to go there because they see one team that they can help. And then they see nine teams that they have no idea what they're doing. So our sort of hypothesis was that if we create a place for those to just be just only the game mentors and only the game teams, mm. then that would work. So. Actually, in the beginning, uh, how, how it began was that I just started emailing people, like tens, hundreds of people every day, like, oh, this is the kind of thing we're doing. So you're leading this huge game studio. Like, why don't you become our mentor? Like, why don't, why don't we do this together? And like, I would say like 80, 90 percent said yes. Okay. It was like super rare that we got a no. And it's the same in Finland. Like, we just started talking to all the people and they were like, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, you should do it. You should do it. I will help you. And I mean, that's, that's, that was my first sort of uh, uh, contact with the games industry. And I was super surprised how 
open and, and caring and supporting the people are. So that was, as I said, I'm sorry, no, was it that, <laughs> that <laughs> no difficult? No difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's great. Uh, and uh, why did you want to be one of the founders of Game Founders? What is important? Well, the, well what is very I've, important for I've you? worked with startups for a long time, and um, I, but I, I work with let's let's say like even a bit uh, before the accelerator stage, but even like younger startups, and I always saw that there was like a gap in 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 that um, stage of the growth, and uh, so I, I just I just really wanted to do this, and I really like working with uh, with teams and with startups and helping them figure out a way to make their business successful and also connect them with a lot of people because we have a, a huge network. So it's sort of like the being like the connecting point is, is something that I really like and I see that we are really contributing to a lot of different studios. So that mm. sort of like gives back like a good feeling for us as well. Mm. And you have seen over a thousand gaming startups and you have invested in 46 and in your seminar you, was, you were telling that there is 10 more coming in a month. So it's a, it's a lot. So when there's coming so many startups at you, what do you notice uh, fir first when they come? What, is, what, is, what do you see first? Well, I mean, I think that actually the reason why they come to us in the first place is that they cannot really figure out the business side. Like, you know, if you look at, I would even say almost all around the world, like the, the technical talent is there a lot of the time. So there are so many good programmers and artists and they know like what kind of game they want to make, but they're not really that good at business. So I think, okay. I think gaming is one of the, um, uh, like what I like about gaming is that it's one of the creative industries that doesn't feel embarrassed about making money. You know, and sometimes, <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, artists are like, you know, if I yeah. make a lot of money, then it's not art anymore. Like in gaming, it's fine to make money, but, uh, but still it, like the skill is not really there that much. If you look at like universities, then they teach you more or less like programming and art and game design, but they don't really teach you how to build a studio. I mean, some programs do, but it's still rare. So, yeah. so like that is that is what we see a lot is that this part is missing, and then then we sort of like you know take the next step and see can we help that specific team? Can like do we have somebody in our network? Do we believe in what they want to go for? And uh, and that's that's how we make our decisions as well. Okay, so have have there been any team that you just saw them and you were like, yeah, I, we want to invest on them? Yes, of course, ah. of course. I mean, you know, we we uh, choose currently uh, 20 new teams per year. So this year, in the beginning of the year, we already took 10 new teams, and now we're taking again 10 teams. And beginning okay. of next year, we're taking again 10 teams. So we are always choosing them. Usually, less than 10 percent that uh, apply to us get accepted. So yeah. they really need to stand out, and uh, I mean that's that's how we choose all of them. <laughs> Are there some kind of um, uh, examples? What how do you stand out from those thousands of appliers? Um, I would say to think about the business side, because a lot of the time we get teams that just love their game, and they just show you their game, and they're like, oh, this is such a good game, like <laughs> this is why you should invest. But if you think about why investors invest in the first place, is that they want to see the money coming back at them, let's say three years, five years down the line. So they also need to think about what's next. I mean, you just cannot think about one game because in three to five years, you must have already, you know, maybe three or five games or whatever your strategy is. So a lot of the time people don't think past tomorrow. Yeah. But but they actually should. If you want to build a business, you should know, like, this is my end goal and these are the steps I'm going to take and this is the first step and that's why I'm doing it. So, like, you know, figuring that out. And, and sometimes we just talk with them, even once. And then they're like, yeah, I should think about that. That's a good idea. Like, let's do that. And then they come up with something. But they just don't think about, you know, they need to do it. Yeah, so maybe dreaming big is like a good opportunity. Well, I mean, if you don't <laughs> dream, then you don't have anything to, to strive for. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. And you were already talking about in your seminar, but some of our viewers weren't there. So uh, how long are you going to be with the team? So we are with the team, well, physically in the same place for three months. So they come to our hub currently in Kuala Lumpur and they spend their three months, they meet different mentors, they have different seminars and events and everything. 
but uh, because we also invest in them, then we become their shareholders, and we will be that with them uh, until uh, some some like somebody else comes and and buys us out, or they buy us out, or so. I mean, for for a while. Okay, so for a long while. And have have there been uh, many that have bought you out, or are you with all those forty? There have been a few, but uh, but still the majority are are operating currently and uh, and growing. So they 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 haven't been like uh, major buyouts yet. Okay, and what kind of team is worth investing? Is there a leader and a programmer and also the artists, or what kind of team mm. are you well, looking for? Well, at the fr like the the main thing is that there needs to be a team. Because a lot of people think that, you know, I'm alone, I make these really good games, like I'm a programmer and I can do some art and like, you know, I, I know people, so let, like, I'll just do it myself. I mean, there are, ex like, there are exceptions. We saw this uh, um, one guy that was like making a game alone that was like getting millions of downloads, then he made the next Whoa. one, it did the same thing. And he, didn't, he said like, I don't want to, you know, have a team, I want to do it this the way that I do it. And I mean, then that's fine as well, but that's not something that we are necessarily looking for. Yeah. So yes, as you said, you know, programmer, artist, it's a good thing if you have a separate person that, do, that does the business and, and marketing as well. But it really depends on like how many games do you have, what kind of games do you have, like what, what are the needs of your community? Do you have a big community or, you know, what, what kind of role should be there in, in, uh, in a studio? So we always look at it one by one. And it's it's not like you have to have everything together before you come to us. <laughs> okay. It's still like, you know, you, you must just understand that, you know, this is what I have and this is what I'm planning for and this is what I need for it. So sort of, you know, the teams need to understand what they still are lacking. Yeah, and it was interesting that you were telling about that you are not looking for a good game. You are looking for a good team. So actually they can come pretty undone f to you. Yes, so they don't necessarily need to have a game launched, yeah. but they need to have some kind of product because we want to see what they perceive as quality. Like, you know, if, if somebody s comes and, uh, you know, let's invest in me, th I have no idea what kind of product you even can put out. Mm. So maybe your art is like super ugly and maybe your code <laughs> is like super crappy. So <laughs> we need to see that they're able to, to ha like, you know, make a product that, that, is, that is something that we perceive as quality as well. Yeah. And and then then that is fine. But uh, um, as I said uh, before as well, the game that they come with us with is not necessarily the one that is going to start making money for them. Okay. Have have there been uh, like a team that comes with a really crappy game and you're looking like, oh, that's not going to be a success. But then the team is really great and you're like, hmm, I see potential there. Well, um, I wouldn't really say that they come with a crappy game, but <laughs> but we have a lot of teams that like they go on, they make their second and their third game, and only then they start making money. Uh -huh. So it's still, you know, if you come with like an almost finished product, then it's m maybe sometimes more difficult to change that than it is to make a totally new one. So mm. it it always it always depends on how far the game is already. Okay, and. Uh, what are the most often made mistakes when the teams come to you? Mm. Uh, well, actually, my uh, my <laughs> talk on the on the art tech stage was uh, was uh, five ways to kill an indie. So um, I don't know. Do I remember all those five? Uh, I'm not sure. So the the first one is is definitely get lost in uh, in outsourcing. So that means a lot of the teams they they find somebody who wants them to do bits and pieces of their games and they just get paid by an hourly rate and they don't have time for their own game so a lot of indies sort of like go there and then they don't even realize that they don't even have any time at all for their own game so nobody's making their own game and and they just remain kind of like an outsourcing company that's something that we see a lot um, second thing was um, that you polish your game forever that's, that's also something, you know, you, there's always something to tweak and there's always something to polish and, and make it better and then it never gets released. That's something that, uh, that we, we don't encourage. It's actually really nice to get your game out as fast as you can because then the people can give you feedback. They can say, you know, I like this, I don't like that. You see the metrics, you can, you can make it better, but you can make it better based on what the players say, not what you alone in your head sort of think. Um, the third thing was um, to not uh, sort of randomly jump from platform to platform, but like have some kind of focus. 
So it's it's okay to switch platforms, but it's not okay to to do it like all the time. Like people should still understand what is their focus, what is their path, and and where they want to go, and not just sort of like run from one opportunity to another, but uh, but have a vision. Uh, the fourth one was waiting until an investor shows up to start making your game. <laughs> so often that does not happen. A lot of people come to us and say like, we have this cool game, if you give us money, we'll, we'll all quit our jobs and start making it. But uh, then I always say, you know, you need to be your first investor in your game. So if you don't invest your free time, then I'm not gonna invest your money because like you need to believe in it more. Yeah. And the fifth thing I totally forgot, uh, only make games you like to play. Oh yes. <laughs> oh thank you. Oh you have. <laughs> yeah, I have notes here. <laughs> <laughs> I should make notes on what I say. Um, yeah. So so only make games that you that you like to play versus check what the market needs and what you can actually make into a business. So that was that was the last one. Like a lot of studios get born by a group of friends coming together and saying like, oh, you know this kind of game, I would like to play that, but, but like this and that and with this twist, let's make this game. And then mm. they make this game and at the end of it, it's like, okay, so what now? And nobody else actually likes it and they didn't test it and they didn't launch it. And, and so, yeah, I mean, you cannot make games like that forever. If you want mm. to turn it into a business, you also need to analyze the other side. Yeah, that's true. And yeah, I was listening to your seminar and there were really good points actually. And uh, about the polishing your game forever, uh, how perfect does it have to be? Like how undone game can, can you publish? That is always like the toughest question and there is no right or wrong answer there. Because I mean, different platforms, different, you know, sometimes you just technically need to have a lot done before you can even push it out. Yeah. But um, I mean, we have a lot of uh, really nice um, cases where we see people uh, already launching like pre-alpha, something that they consider like really bad, but they already are get gathering a community around it. So they get a lot of players who give them feedback. So they mm. change the game based on that and more people come on and they play and sort of like, then when you launch it, then you already have so many people who love it and, and they are already going to uh, uh, download it and, and, and be your players. So, so but as, as I said, there is no right or wrong way <laughs> there. I think it's just, you know, you should sort of like look at, let's say like some kind of industry standards, like this big of a game, like how much time does it make to, to make it? Like mobile game, I mean, six months, you should have something out. Yeah. And then you can test it. You can test it in a closed way so that the world doesn't see it, but still you need to figure out what people think. So if I understand correctly, it is actually good to develop the game with the players and not by all yourself. That, yes, I mean, one way or another. I'm not saying that like 100% of games need to be launched from day one and like in really <laughs> crappy format. <laughs> but uh, I mean, if the, if the game sort of like requires a community and if it's possible to launch it earlier, then I would encourage to get uh, feedback from the players because then the, the game sort of evolves in a way how the players want to play it. Hmm. And people are very grateful if you do that, even let like, Let's say if somebody sends you a message and you answer it, they're super grateful and they're like your loyal players forever. Mm, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. And your other point, uh, only make games you like to play. Uh, you were talking about a really interesting uh, team you were having that they are making games out of this ch uh, children racing car, but on the other side, um, in the side they are making games that they really love. So. Is it, uh, is it a good way to make uh, money with other games so that you can make games what you like to actually do? Mm. I mean, that's the main issue with indie studios. You know, how do you, how do you make a living? I mean, people have to eat at the end of the mm. day. So like outsourcing is one way, figuring out a way how to earn money from uh, smaller games is another way. Harassing your mother <laughs> for money is a third way. So, I mean, everybody have their own uh, options. But uh, but yes, I mean, definitely, it, it doesn't always mean that you get to do 100% of the time exactly what you love. But sometimes you do other things to make money so that you can make whatever you want to do. Yeah. And uh, when, 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 you were, when you were talking about the investors, you said that uh, Finnish have actually extra 10 points when they just say that we are from Finland. So is it actually true? 
I think so. I think so. <laughs> I mean, um, a lot of uh, like investors and publishers, they're always looking for like Nordic countries and especially Finland. And I mean, of course, you have so many people here on the on the job market who used to be like in, in Rovio or Remedy or like, you know, people move from place to place. And uh, we have a lot of uh, like teams that, oh yeah, we have a former Rovio <laughs> or a former whatnot. And, and that, that always sort of like, uh, that works. Yeah, okay, that's good a, to that's know. That's the standard of quality, yeah. <laughs> you Finns have it good. <laughs> Yeah. So you have been uh, regularly speaking all over the w- world about games and strategies, investment, and networking. Uh, so, do you also headhunt for teams while you are going around the globe? Yes. Yes. Definitely. I mean, we do a lot of the things at the same time. So we headhunt for teams, but also we look for partnerships for our existing teams. Okay. So I mean, when I'm speaking here, or when I was speaking at the Artec stage before. You know, if somebody listened to me and they say like, "Oh, this is exactly what I need," you know, I will I will email her, and uh-huh. I will figure out what that is. So this is a lot of the ways how how we get people to to apply, because we we currently have actually applications from around 80 countries. Okay. So nice. all over the world, and like a lot of it is because we are working with different partners, but also we are traveling around the world, and and people know us. So so these kinds of events are are quite amazing i mean i think a lot of those guys you know playing there who are like 14 15 mm. in in five years they're like yeah but i want to make something like this <laughs> you know and then they start figuring it out ah. and uh, what do you enjoy the most in your job i enjoy connecting people that's something that uh, that we can we can do and and that's really something that i like so if i see somebody has some kind of an issue or or they they need a partner or something then we always find somebody who can help them and then we connect them and we we see the young studios grow that's that's something that's uh, that's very rewarding for us oh. oh that's really nice and about the future what is game founders going to do next is there a ultimate dream you're wanting to <laughs> Yeah, conquer the world. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you know, as the same that as we say to our studios, we also need to think bigger and and we need to to evolve somewhere. So we started out in Estonia. We we were thinking about you know would it also work elsewhere. So that's why we expanded to Asia. We figured out that it does work elsewhere. So now we are looking at you know maybe we will do two accelerators at the same time in different parts of the world, or you know we'll mm. we'll figure out how we can help the teams more and how we can sort of like um, be more accessible and so that more teams can can come and and we can help more. And uh, where can we see you next speaking or where can we uh, Mm -hmm. where can we follow you? Uh, Well, social media, GameFounders.com, also GameFounders on Facebook and Twitter, uh, just GameFounders. Um, I think I personally will probably be speaking in November in uh, a game conference called Level Up in Kuala Lumpur. Okay. Uh, but uh, perhaps even before that, these these events come and go very suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, thank you, Kadri, for being here with us. It has been a pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. I've heard so much about Assembly, but I've never been, and this is like truly amazing. <laughs> and for the viewers, remember to go check GameFounders.com, also on Facebook and Twitter. And thank you for watching Fireside Chat.